sort of how to construct an argument, how to write a thesis, most importantly, but also in general, sort of looking at the underpinnings of why it is that we write, uh, why it is that we write in general, but also why it is that we write persuasive arguments, why it is um, that we value this tool in terms of uh, being able to communicate with one another and make arguments, make points, kind of get somewhere in the conversation, uh, contribute to it. So I want to talk a little bit to start about the values of reason, argument, and debate. These are sort of the principles, as I said, that like underpin or lay the groundworks for essays, specifically persuasive essays, uh, where you make an argument. Um, and I want to talk about this specifically because like this semester we've been exploring communication from mostly from the point of view of social construction, um, social construction is perspective. So to the point that we have been saying that social reality is socially constructed, which means that it's intersubjective at best, uh, at worst decided by people in positions of power without much sort of collective or democratic say. Um, but also social constructed in the sense that we, uh, sorry, social reality is social constructed also in the sense that we have to communicate with others and we use language to think, uh, not just with people, not just to talk with people, but to literally think for ourselves. I've made that point multiple times and I always think it's important to keep making it. Um, and we we use the language and we talk with, the, with each other in order to come to terms with uh, our realities, our social realities at the least but also sort of our relations to material environments as well. Um, and in order to talk about reason and argumentation and debates, we sort of have to step out of this social constructionist framework, at least a little bit, and talk about um, objectivity, logic, reason, rationality, legitimacy, validity, and factual statements. So. Just as an example, it might seem obvious, but it's worth going over as it relates to social construction. Like it would be, it would be untrue to say that, for example, like Matthew McConaughey was the president of the United States from 2008 to 2012. That's simply a false statement. Um, whether or not we're talking about social construction, right? So public figures like presidents and countries like the USA, we can say that those are social constructs. Um, to the extent that uh, we socially construct like positions of power in socially constructed governments of socially constructed national boundaries, often achieved by war and conflict and people in groups and position of power rather than, as I said before, genuine collective decision making. But nonetheless, they're social constructs. And even if we say that uh, that presidents and governments and, and countries are social constructs. We simply cannot say that Matt McConaughey was the president of the US in 2008, 2012, because there are such things as historical facts and documentations that obviously prove otherwise. So today I wanna show you a series of videos, three or four videos. One of them is actually just a screenshot of, of one video. So three videos and a screenshot that go more in depth about the importance of reason uh, and validity and communication and argumentation or what we might call communicative rationality, communication rationality. Um, so the first video I'm gonna show is from a pretty popular YouTube channel called Crash Course. They have a nice series of segments called How to Argue. Uh, another video I wanna show you is called uh, is a tutorial to polemics, might be a word they haven't heard before. It'll define it in the video. And other video I wanna watch is a video called How to Win Arguments Without Making Enemies. Uh, and then lastly, there's a snapshot of a video I wanna show you just about writing a persuasive uh, argumentative thesis statement and also like following through with that thesis statement with um, sort of considering paragraphs as mini essays, building a bunch of mini essays into 
a larger essay, typically five paragraphs. If we're dealing with a shorter paper, that formula just extends as the paper gets longer. So the first one I want to watch, I'll pull up, like I said, it's the how to argue crash course. We're just going to watch the first three and a half minutes that I think are interesting. Talks about the sort of where we get our understandings of reason and rationality as they relate to human behavior and human thinking and human interacting. Uh, talking about the influences from like Plato and Aristotle who are philosophers um, from ancient Greece, I believe. So let me pull up that video. One moment. Okay. Crash Course Philosophy is brought to you by Squarespace. Squarespace, share your passion with the world. Aristotle once described humans as the rational animal. Well, actually, he said that man is the rational animal, but we don't have to be sexist just because he was. And if you've ever gotten into an argument with someone about religion or politics or which Hemsworth is the hottest, then you've experienced how irrational people can be about their opinions. So what Aristotle meant is that rationality is our distinguishing characteristic. It's what sets us apart from the beasts. And no matter how much you disagree with someone about God or Obama or Chris Hemsworth, you can at least grant that they are not beasts. Because, most of the time at least, people can be persuaded by arguments. You use arguments all the time, in the comments, at family dinners, with your friends. You probably just don't think of them the same way that philosophers do. When you try and convince your parents to loan you the car, or when you're talking up Crash Course to your friends, you are using arguments. Thanks, by the way. Each time you tell someone to do or believe something, or when you're explaining why you do or believe something, you are giving an argument. The problem is, the vast majority of people aren't really good at arguments. We tend to confuse making a good argument with, like, having witty comebacks, or just making your points more loudly and angrily, instead of building a case on a solid foundation of logic, which can be harder than it sounds. But learning about arguments and strong reasoning will not only make you a better philosopher, it will also set you up to be a more persuasive person, someone who people will listen to, someone who's convincing. So yeah, these skills are beneficial no matter what you want to do with your life, so you might as well know how to argue properly. If you want to learn how to argue, then you should probably start around 2400 years ago when Plato was laying out how reason can and should function in the human mind. He believed that we all have what he called a tripartite soul, what you might think of as yourself or your psyche divided into three parts. First, there's the rational or logical part of the soul, which represents cool reason. This is the aspect of yourself that seeks the truth and is swayed by facts and arguments. When you decide to stop eating bacon for two meals a day because as delicious as it is, it's bad for you, then you make that decision with the guidance of the rational part of your soul. But then there's the spirited aspect, often described as the emotional part of the self, although that doesn't really quite capture it. The spirited soul isn't just about feeling, it's also about how your feelings fuel your actions. It's the part that responds in righteous anger at injustice, the part that drives your ambition and calls upon you to protect others. It gives you a sense of honor and duty and is swayed by sympathy. So if you decide to stop eating bacon because you just finished reading Charlotte's Web, then now you're in love with Wilbur, then you're being guided by the spirited part of your soul. But we share the next part of our soul with other animals, be they pig or moose or aardvark. The appetitive part is what drives you to eat, have sex, and protect yourself from danger. It is swayed by temptations that are carnal and visceral. So at those times when you go ahead and just eat all the bacon because it just smells so dang good, the appetitive aspect of your soul is in control. Now, Plato believed that the best human beings, and I should point out here that Plato most definitely did believe that some people were were better than others, are always ruled by the rational part of their soul because it works to keep the spirited and the appetitive parts in check. People who allow themselves to be ruled by their spirited or appetitive selves are base, he believed, and not fully, properly human. Now, most of us don't buy into the concept of the tripartite soul anymore, or the idea that some humans are less human than others, but we do understand that we're all motivated by physical desires, emotional impulses, and rational arguments. And philosophers continue to agree with Plato that reason should be in the driver's Seat. So, okay, that was the first one. Big emphasis on what he was saying there about 
not really following this so much so as like a science, right, or as absolutely true, but it's a good way to consider it as like an interpretive scheme. It's a good way to understand, like you said, we have this sort of, we have these rational moments, these spirited emotional moments, and then these moments where, you know, we're driven by our biological needs or something like that. And, you know, we might think that when we're like communicating that we're just using like the logical, rational part of it, but our emotions come into play, our desires come into play. And most importantly though, is this understanding of rationality as seeking truth and persuading people, swaying people by facts and arguments rather than only, at least only, but rather than only by uh, sort of fear mongering in one sense, or at least in just some sense of being too emotional or too spirited. In, um, in politics, we might think of this as like a populist president who sort of uh, uses fear and excitement as ways to uh, gain a, a political base uh, rather than necessarily logical arguments or policies that can help the country. Um, so you can see here when we're talking about rationality and we're talking about logic and argumentation, there's always with that is rhetoric, which is the side of logic of like, okay, now that I have these facts and I have these claims, now I need to like package it in, uh, now I need to create a sort of rhetorical package for delivering it to people. Um, and this is most clear in an essay when you're obviously uh, taking your time and researching and making sure you're not saying anything that's just an opinion or a feeling, but rather actually um, backing up your claims with research. Uh, but this is also the case in 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 public as well, um, and just talking with people. Like they said, there's sort of you're, when you're arguing with your spouse or with your parents. Um, sometimes you use the more logical route. Sometimes you maybe make them feel bad, um, or vice versa, as a way to sort of get what you want. Um, so let's watch the second one. And. All right, this one is the polemic tutorial. It's very cool. I'm just gonna show the first 51 seconds. Um, good information, more about this rhetorical angle, which is like, okay, you have the facts. Now you need to figure out how exactly you're going to deliver them. Okay, so knowing who your audience is is incredibly important when you're writing to persuade. The reason is, is because it allows you then to direct all of your energy to that particular individual. You know how they're thinking, you know how they're feeling, and that way you're going to have a much better chance of convincing them that your position on the topic is better than theirs. That's essentially what you're trying to do. And an excellent way to make sure that you're really thinking about the audience is to engage in this particular technique, which is called polemic writing. And as the definition says there, it very much ensures that you're thinking about what the other person is thinking before you try and present your own points on the topic. So let's have a look at. So that was that. that was a very quick definition. A polemic is when you're writing in a way that takes into account what the, the person, your audience, is thinking, is feeling, taking into account what you think they might respond with. Um, so this is very important, not necessarily in essay writing. It's important generally. It's, it can be important in essay writing, but it's especially important in debates or just trying to get your opinion across in a way that you actually want to come to some mutual agreement or persuade the other person rather than just sort of spout how you feel or um, relieve some emotions by, you know, saying whatever it is that you need to get off your chest. So on that note, like I kind of have this interesting example. Let me stop sharing. Um, so I was at this, I was at this um, uh, poll, uh, voting poll for the North Carolina uh, primaries back in, uh, I don't know when it was, May, May or June, I think. Uh, but anyways, I was working there as just, I was a poll worker, general poll worker, helping where help is needed. Um, 
And this man comes walking up about to go vote, right? He uh, walks past the volunteer poll greeters. There's these volunteer poll greeters who are like people at the polling stations handing out flyers um, for their preferred candidates, um, trying to persuade people to, to, you know, change their vote at the last minute or something like that, um, which is completely legal as long as you are something like 50 feet away from the polling door. Um, and this guy, he comes in, he identifies himself as an independent, right? So he's not a Democrat or Republican. Um, and he walks by the greeters, the volunteer greeters who are handing out, mostly handing out flyers for Democrat candidates. Um, and the man, he walks past kind of sneeringly and he says like, you all should be ashamed of yourself. Absolutely despicable what you're doing here. You are all mentally challenged, right? And one of the volunteers that was handing out the candidate information starts shouting at the man. He says, excuse me, sir, you're being ableist. You are, that's, that's ableist. Um, now, of course, like the volunteer kind of has a point, right? The man was saying that you are mentally challenged if you support the Democrats, which is a big co-optation of the phrase mentally challenged, which should be reserved for actual cases of like disability, right? And so it's not very nice to make fun of able people by calling them disabled, right? So this volunteer had a perfectly fine reason to, you know, be upset and say something in response. But on the other side of this, we have this volunteer, they're thinking that saying you're being ableist, you're being ableist is actually gonna do anything to resolve the situation, let alone change that ignorant person's mind. Ableist, well, a perfectly, perfectly fine word, perfectly fine concept, it's still fairly academic, it's activist terminology and throwing it around like can sign, can kind of, it's maybe it's not, but throwing it around can seem pretty elitist and like you're coming from this condescending perspective, like you're smarter than them, like you're morally better than them. So in this situation, like we have these, we have both people here, right? We have the angry man yelling at the volunteer. We have the volunteer, you know, responding how they do. And they both storm off, they leave the situation, hating the other side even more. And like, do I know how to handle the situation better? Like, no, I do not. But I certainly think that it could have gone better, could have been handled better um, with room for actual discussion. Even if someone comes in red hot, red hot calling someone mentally challenged. Just like point here is like, if the goal Maybe your goal isn't to persuade or change someone's mind or make them see the right path or whatever. Uh, but if that is your goal, try to be the better person in that situation, right? Like try to talk to them, try to talk from their level, take into account what you think their beliefs are, what you think their values are, even if you absolutely disagree with them, what you think their knowledge or ideological frameworks are before presenting your point about the issue. This right here is an example of a polemic, right? Taking into account what sort of, whatever you think it is, it could be the most garbage crap that you think the other person believes, but taking that into account and sort of trying to get into their sort of language game, the way that they come to see the world, it takes some time, right? It's not like you can perfectly think up a response taking into account all this information in like the 15 seconds that this interaction goes by. But if you did have more time, like you do with an essay, especially an essay in like a popular magazine or a journal article that's going to be read by people that you know the issue is controversial and there will be disagreement on, you need to take into account uh, what they think so that you can have comebacks before they critique, right? So you can have your answer to the critiques already is another good way to think about that. So that's one video. now or that's the second video, I should say. Now I wanna watch one more. And this one's a longer one. I'll turn my mic and video off. Uh, this one is how to win an argument without making enemies. It's by a video producer on YouTube called Charisma on Command. But the main example is the way that Trevor Noah, 
who is on one of those late comedy talk shows. He's a comedian. The way that he talks about in interviews, or sorry, not talks about the book, but the way that he interviews his guests, specifically guests that he disagrees with or expects to disagree with. So we're going to watch this one. And we're going to watch this one in full as well. Sometimes arguments can get heated and spiral out of control. Or how about the more than a billion those, people who those aren't are fanatical, too. who don't punch well, women, who just want to just go to the store. Okay, wait a second. 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 Wait a First off, Trevor has a simple but effective habit to prevent emotions from getting too heated. His sub-communications indicate that he isn't there for a fight. To see this principle in action, take a look at this exchange from his debate with Tommy Lahren and notice Trevor's tone of voice compared to Tommy's. That's not, that's not fair and that's true. No, that's, no, 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 it is fair, Trevor, because the shooter not... said, point blank shooter said he's doing this because of Black Lives Matter. Yes, and there are many things you can say. As people get more frustrated, they have a tendency to raise their voices and talk faster, like Tommy does here. In this case, both sides' ability to change their mind completely shuts down, and they dig into their positions to prepare for a verbal sparring match. You can tell that this is beginning to happen when both people rush to talk over one another, like here. I go, I saw people and race as chocolate. I wouldn't use that. When, no, I wouldn't use I, that. No, no. I, I, I'm that color but and I wouldn't I say that. In these sorts of situations, no matter how good your point is, it's not going to be well received. So the first order of business is simply to slow things down and indicate that fighting isn't necessary. So as Trevor gains control, you can see him deliberately pause in these situations, which reduces the tension and opens the other person up to his perspective. That color but when I, I wouldn't up, say that. Listen, but, when I, when I yeah. grew up, when I grew up, I believed that all people were chocolates. A very basic but tried and true method when this starts to happen to you is simply to take a deep breath as you are about to speak. It helps to slow things down tremendously. Now, another key element that indicates Trevor isn't looking to fight is his inflection. In last week's Harvey Specter breakdown, we talked about how a downward inflection can be a powerful tool when you're giving commands, and that may have given the impression that upward inflections are somehow bad. This is definitely not the case, though. In fact, upward inflections are excellent for de-escalating conflict, because it reassures others that you're not commanding them or trying to control them, which is what gets most people up set in arguments in the first place. Because you're the first person I've met who said this. I've seen this message online. I'm not labeling you as the bad person. I just want to know if you've ever thought of the how. That's all I want to know. The last key piece you see from Trevor about subcommunicating that you're not there for a fight is simply the ability to crack a joke. It might seem counterintuitive to slow down the flow of debate with moments of levity, but this actually makes you more persuasive since you're subcommunicating that you are on the same side as someone when you can laugh with them. Now, there's obviously tons of ways to crack jokes, but it can be as simple as misinterpreting a word like here. And then I got closer to the campaign and I started seeing some of the things he was saying and I started seeing the effect he was having on people and the things that he was saying that was touching people and making them he feel like He was touching they... people. Yeah, he was. He really was. Or just about any argument, you can just poke fun at the fact that both sides typically want to demonize one another, like here. And so I, one you, of the you, you, you one of the good ones. <laughs> Cracking jokes like this will help release some of the tension that comes when you're debating fiercely held beliefs and hopefully move you towards a more constructive outcome. However, keep in mind that if you are going to make jokes, you need to also be willing to take a joke and to laugh at it, even when that joke targets your side like here. He's so really partially crazy, partially crazy. Uh, well, hey, that works in Washington. <laughs> you got Bernie. <laughs> uh. <laughs> This should give you a good base of sub-communications, but the literal words that you use are important too. And that's why the next point is that whenever possible, ask questions instead of making statements. The reason this is so significant is that questions tend to come across as less confrontational than statements, provided that they're not provocative accusatory questions. Now, there's two general kinds of questions that Trevor uses. First, you see genuine questions aimed at better understanding the other person's viewpoint. Again, note the upward inflection in this next clip that indicates he's seriously curious. And now I would like to know from your side, genuinely, as someone who's won, do you believe that Donald Trump will follow through on his promises? 
the goal of these type of questions is to fully understand the opposing position. So many people get into debates with the straw man of the person that they're debating, assuming that they believe things that the Democrats believe, or Republicans believe, or Christians believe, or atheists believe, or whatever. You must recognize that you do not know any individual's beliefs simply by knowing one of their affiliations. You need to get to what they believe as an individual, and genuine questions are the only way there. To make sure that you're actually understanding someone correctly, a fantastic tool is to try to state back to them their own beliefs in your words and to not proceed until they confirm that you've actually got it. You see this right here. You're saying that populism both on Trump's side and on the left, are, 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 there's a danger of that hurting America's That's right. But look, but there, there's nothing wrong with a little populism. Keep in mind, though, it's not simply about using the words so you're saying and then putting words in the other person's mouth. We saw that in the Jordan Peterson, Kathy Newman debate that you need to make a genuine good faith attempt to rephrase the other's position, not like you see here. You're saying that we should organize our societies along the lines of the lobsters. Now, once you have a good grasp of someone's beliefs, you can begin to ask the second main type of question, questions that probe for inconsistencies in beliefs in a non-accusatory way. A very recent interview with the Republican Senator Rand Paul has a few great examples of this from Trevor. If two uh, people I'm, do a bad thing, does it cancel each other out then? I, I'm saying that most people, people go, look at what happened in Venezuela, socialism. Then I go, does the corruption not count at all? You know, de credit default swaps, that's capitalism running rampant. That's people going, you can buy a thing that doesn't exist and nobody understands it and you don't have to regulate it and then all of a sudden the markets crash, people lose their houses. Isn't that also capitalism? This questioning style of conversation is known as the Socratic method and it's the reason that Socrates is the most famous philosopher ever. So use it, it works incredibly well. In short, you're first attempting to understand people's positions as best you can and then frame your disagreements in the form of questions that gives the other person a chance to respond without feeling cornered and it makes them much less likely to be offended. Moving on to the next point, let's have a look at what to do when the positions are reversed and you're the one who is having your beliefs challenged, but let's say it's in a way that you feel is unfair. Your main goal here is to confidently defend yourself without coming across as antagonistic and there is a surprisingly effective way to achieve both at the same time and it's something that I like to call yes but. Now you've probably heard of yes and where you agree and then build upon someone's statement in order to develop on a joke, like an improv comedy. In an argument, the same principle of finding agreement is very important. The only difference is that you're going to follow your agreement up by showing where you disagree. That's the but part. Now, for instance, in this next clip, Trevor says yes, that he is splitting hairs, but then goes on to say why that's the right thing to do. Take a look. No. You're splitting hairs here. No, but that is exactly what we should be doing. Because what you're doing is creating... I'm not sure I would, you're creating I'm not racial sure jokes. I would say No, you're creating you monoliths. Say. It may seem subtle, but finding any area of agreement can be critical to moving forward without making enemies. People's egos get tied up in their arguments, and oftentimes, when you rebut someone completely, they feel personally attacked, even if your position is perfectly logical. So find a way to validate them by saying yes to something about them or their argument. It can be recognizing the value of one part of what they said. <laughs> like, I, no, I'll give you that. I'll give you that. That was uh, that's pretty. It's nice to hear somebody say that the religion is not the problem. These yeah, crazy people. Yeah. Are. Or when you think nothing they've said makes sense, simply recognizing that they probably have positive intentions and believe what they're saying can be a really great way to move forward. Here's my, here's my thing. Like all these points that you make are great, and I do believe that you believe them. And I don't believe anyone is actively trying. There are a few people who are trying to be bad from their point of view. Uh, but when I look at what you're saying. Now, in order to do this technique effectively, you need to know specifically where you agree with someone and specifically where you don't. So identifying hidden premises is critical. Hidden premises are unspoken assertions baked into a question or a statement. When someone creates an argument that feels wrong but you can't quite explain why, sometimes that's because you can't find the hidden premise. And sometimes it's because you're experiencing cognitive dissonance, but we'll leave that for another video to focus on the hidden premise. Here's one quick example. See if you can spot it here. What do you say to people who say, like, uh, The Daily Show can be an echo chamber? Did you catch the implied hidden premise? It's that being an echo chamber is a bad thing, something that you shouldn't be. So watch how Trevor responds. Everything is an echo chamber. I think that's a term that people use to try and justify what a group of people are saying in and amongst themselves. I think for myself, you will always have an echo chamber because people who watch your show are people who like your show. 
This is a perfect example of yes, but. In this instance, by saying yes, The Daily Show is an echo chamber, he's validating Charlemagne. But then saying that it's natural to be so, he roots out that hidden premise that it shouldn't somehow be an echo chamber. And that way he is able to agree but defend himself elegantly. And we discussed this topic further in our Ben Shapiro video if you'd like to play this game a few more times. But for now, let's get to the mindset that ties all of this together. Because everything in this video can move from a simple technique to a natural way of being if you adopt new mindsets. And there are three keys. First off, in every argument, you are not necessarily right. And this is especially true if you've never amended your belief system, be it political, religious, or otherwise. In those cases, chances are you're operating from conditioning. So genuinely trying to understand other perspectives can help you towards a more accurate view of the world. Now, this is obviously very hard to do because your ego gets involved. So the second key mindset is that adjusting your beliefs, changing your mind in the heat of an argument does not diminish you at all. As my freshman year philosophy teacher said, the goal of argument is not to be right, it is to get it right. So be proud of yourself when you change your beliefs in accordance with new evidence, even if you technically lost an argument for it to happen. Now third, if in fact you've taken the time to understand the other person and they're still wrong, it's almost never because they are evil. It's because they are somehow ignorant. Dialogue can help to lift that ignorance, but only if you don't trigger their defense mechanisms by attacking them as people. Now, Trevor summarizes this well on Hot Ones. You know, I don't want to destroy you. I want to engage with you. And I, I, think, I think a lot of the time as people, if you have ideas you believe in, you should be willing to engage or you should be willing to test those ideas against somebody that, that you don't agree with. If you allow these mindsets to sink in, everything from the subcommunications to asking the Socratic questions to the yes but technique will come much more naturally as you jointly work with the people you're talking to to find solid and true common ground. To be honest, I find that that principle of seeking first to understand is very sparse in the modern media. And that's part of why my co-founder Ben and I started a podcast on hope warmingly fantastic all right we don't need to hear the ad but i hope that helped i mean there's a lot of videos out there on this sort of stuff charisma and command's pretty decent um the how to argue crash course that we watched one of the videos of also pretty well and then more specifically for writing um uh you can find stuff on YouTube about writing, but I mean, I just think exploring it from a more general perspective um, rather than something that's necessarily focused on writing is helpful in a lot of ways that you communicate in your life, right? We, we communicate with so many different mediums and it's not always that like our mode of communication is to try to persuade, but at least, it's very common mode of communication to just try to be understood, to try to be recognized, to try to feel like you're being heard and hearing the other people, right? So there's, these were some good videos on that, I thought. Um, but now I want to actually transition over to writing more specifically. Um, so I'm just going to show this screen grab real quick and then talk to you a little bit about our final paper and connect them, right? So okay. We have here basic introduction, you know, your introduction paragraph, which includes your thesis claim. Within your thesis, doesn't have to be absolutely this formulaic or this amount of points. But it's going to look something like this, right? It's going to look like your claim, and it's going to look like about three points, right? We're using three journal articles for research. So about three points to back it up. And then in your body paragraphs, you know, you can have a paragraph or, or however many feel you need for each point. And then, of course, you end with a conclusion summarizing everything, going back to that main thesis claim that you made in your first paragraph. Right, so an example they use is cell phones belong in school because they save lives, serve as learning tools, and can teach teenagers responsibly. So if this person was doing a research article like we are, they would find one article that's about how cell phones 
can help save lives, one article about how cell phones serve as learning tools, one article about how they can teach teenagers responsibility. And I'm sure there's plenty more research out there on cell phones and why they're useful. I'm sure there's also plenty of research out there on cell phones and why they're not useful. So there could be just as persuasive of an article that's doing the opposite of what this paper is doing. Nonetheless, they're still following the same sort of formula. I say formula because obviously you see it's got claim, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 conclusion. Um, and I'm not one to absolutely stick to formulas, especially in writing, and it's even much harder to do in talking. Um, but it's a nice schema for doing this. And if you get really good at it, kind of like artists or any creator, if you get really good at it, then you can start to sort of deviate from that formula and get creative, get innovative, um, and sort of disrupt expectations while still providing a really nicely written piece.